This is the fourth part of a personal A to Z of liners and cruise ships from the 1920s to the present day. It's in five parts. The ships are shown at sea, approaching or leaving harbours, docked and anchored. Some are short clips, because that's all I have, and some go on for a minute or more. Some of the film has been included before in my DVDs and videos, but a lot has not previously been released, particularly a lot of the black and white post-war material and the most recent up-to-date material taken on video whilst cruising. Quality varies from rather grainy, as you see here, particularly the older film, to the very sharp images taken more recently. Each part is about 50 minutes or longer. I've tried to split them according to alphabetical order. In this part we cover ships with names from O to Q. Here we see Oceana and Adonis at their naming ceremony in Southampton. They were to be called the Two White Sisters after the first two white sisters, Strathnava and Strathaird. However, this particular partnership was not to last quite so long. Oceana is seen leaving Southampton after the ceremony. She followed Adonis down Southampton water. I apologize for the time shown on screen. These pictures were taken in Barbados. We get a good view of her as we sail out of the harbour. Ocean Monarch was built in 1956 by Vickers Armstrong as the Empress of England for Canadian Pacific Lines and sold to Shaw Savile and Albion in 1970. This ship has had a checkered history. She was built by Chantiers d'Atlantique for Sitmar Cruises as Star Princess and then transferred to the P&O and renamed Arcadia in 1997. She was transferred again and became Ocean Village in 2003 and managed by P&O as a trendy ship for younger couples. We are going to pass her as we enter Madeira. Behind her, you'll see the Artemis. The Odessa was launched in 1970. Her building started at Vickers Barrow, but she was finished off by Swan Hunter and named Copenhagen for A.S. Norline. She was sold to the Soviet Union in 1975 and renamed Odessa 
but unless you read Russian, you'll have to take my word for that. She's seen here at the Tilbury landing stage. She will turn here in Gravesend Reach and sail down the river towards the estuary. Built by Nederlandsk S.B. Midge for Stormbart Midge, Nederland, the Orangi of 1938 became an RAN hospital ship under the Dutch flag and returned to service in 1946. In 1964 she was sold to Achille Loro, Rome and renamed Angelina Loro, which sunk after burning out in 1979. We are fortunate indeed to have these lovely pictures of the 1936 Orcades. She was built by Vickers Armstrong as a sister ship to the Orion. Regrettably she didn't last as long being sunk by a U-boat in 1942 under the command of Captain Fox. She's seen here approaching Colombo Harbour. The pilot is going out to board her. Later we see her dropping anchor. The Orient Line started its rebuilding program in 1947. They lost four ships during the war. The first ship of this new program to be launched in 1947 was the Orcades of 28,000 tons. She was used on the Tilbury to Sydney run for the Orient Line and some cruising, and later came into the ownership of P&O in 1966 and was painted white. As passenger numbers on the Australia run started to drop off, particularly as migrants were being flown out to Australia, the Orient Line, along with P&O, scheduled their ships for more and more cruises. 
eventually Orchides was taken to the scrapyard in 1973. Now here's some old footage. Orford was launched in 1927. He was built by Vickers for the Orient Line. She became a trooper in 1939 and was sadly bombed and burnt out in 1940. She was scrapped in 1947. I've included some film around the decks in this case which shows passengers in the late 1920s, early 30s enjoying themselves on board. In those days there was very little professional entertainment. A small band would have played for dances and the deck and the purser's staff would have organized such things as fancy dress balls and race meetings. It was a long five-week journey to Australia and it could become tedious unless you wanted just to relax. And there was plenty of relaxation to be had. We go from a liner of the late 1920s to the Oriana, built and launched in 1960 for the Orient Line. She was so big that they had an awful job trying to get her out of the yard at Vickers Armstrong for fitting out. But by today's standards, you'd call her a minnow. Originally, the Oriana, and indeed the Canberra were built to take passengers to and from Australia with the occasional cruise. She's seen here entering Colombo. By the time Oriana was launched, the Orient Line and the P&O had already merged and Oriana came into P&O ownership in 1966 and was painted white. In 1986 she was sold to the Japanese as a floating hotel in Osaka and then to the Chinese in 1995. She capsized during a typhoon in Dalian in 2005 and was later scrapped. The new Oriana was built by Mayor Weft 
for P&O in 1995. She's seen here in Fremantle in March 2008. We join her again in Nice. She was anchored here awaiting the transfer of the golden cockerel from the Canberra, which was on its last voyage. On this occasion, there was a great deal of patriotic singing and flag waving. We join the Orion as she enters Colombo Harbour. She was built by Vickers and Armstrong in Barrow and launched in 1934 and brought a new look to the Orient Line. She later served as a troop transport from 1939 to 1946 and was the first ship of the Orient Fleet to be reconditioned in 1947. She served as a hotel ship in Hamburg in 1963 and was scrapped later that year. The Oranze was the second of the Orient Line reconstruction program after the war. She was built by Vickers Armstrong and launched in 1950. Her entrance into service was delayed by quite a serious fire. We see her here leaving Sydney. She's turning in Piermont prior to moving out into the harbour and under the bridge. She emerges from under the bridge past Circular Quay and Fort Denison and will make her way up to the Sydney Heads. Oranze was transferred to P&O ownership in 1966 and she was then painted white.
Orontes was the last of the Orient Line's 1920s program of 20,000 tonners. She was built by Vickers Armstrong of Barrow and launched in 1929. She served as a troop ship from 1940 to 1946 and then she re-entered service on the Tilbury to Sydney route. She had the honour of carrying Queen Salote of Tonga to the coronation in 1953. After that she was converted to a one-class ship. Although she had some fair-paying passengers on the outward trip, she carried mostly migrants. On the homeward bound trip she would carry a lot of young Australians who wanted to see England and parts of Europe. She was scrapped in Valencia in 1962. third Orient liner to be built after the war. The Orsova was launched in 1953 and she was nearly 29,000 tons. She was the first all-welded liner. She transferred to P&O ownership along with the other ships of the fleet in 1966 and was scrapped in 1974. These pictures were taken of her at Suez, awaiting her turn to go through the canal.
Finally, we see her in the piano colours of white in Alaskan waters, and then at Copenhagen. We see Otranto first in Colombo Harbour before the war. She was built by Vickers, Armstrong and Barrow for the Orient Line and launched in 1925, just over 20,000 tonnes. She served as a trooper from 1939 to 1947 and returned as a one-class ship on the Australian run after the war. She's seen here on her last voyage on her way home. Oxfordshire was built by Fairfield of Glasgow as a troop ship. She was launched in 1955 and managed by the Bibby Line. She was chartered to Fairline Shipping Corporation in 1963 and in 1964 renamed Fairstar. She was scrapped in 1997. Built by Rheinstahl North Seewerkt Emden, Pacific Princess was 20,300 tons. She was called Sea Venture for Norwegian cruise ships and sold to P&O Princess Line and renamed Pacific Princess. And she, with Island Princess, became the love boats on TV. She's seen here moving up the Thames towards the landing stage at Tilbury.
He remained with Princess Cruises until 2002 when she was sold to Pullmaker and became Viagens. And then in 2008 she was chartered to the new Quail Cruises and operates out of Valencia in Spain. Launched in 1951, the 13,520 Pacifique was originally named Vietnam. She was renamed Pacifique in 1967. Then in 1971, Malaysia Maru. She was scrapped in 1976. Launched in 1998, Paul Gauguin was built by Chantier d'Atlantique for Regent Seven Seas Cruises. She spends her time cruising the French Polynesian Islands. She's seen here in Bora Bora. The Patroclos, a blue funnel liner of 1923, was 11,300 tons. She was sunk by U-99 on November 4, 1940. We watch as some of her passengers go ashore. A very quick view of Pendennis Castle. The 1957 28,000-ton Union Castle liner, seen here in Southampton. Built by Bethlehem Almeida for President Lines, President Cleveland was launched in 1946 and scrapped in 1974. Another President liner launched in 1946, the President Wilson, was slightly larger than her sister. She was also built by Bethlehem Almeida for President Lines and sold in 1973. She was scrapped in 1984. Two clips here of Pretoria Castle being passed at sea. She was built by Harland and Wolf for Union Castle and launched in 1947. She served on the Cape Run until 1975 when she was withdrawn from service. I couldn't leave out these shots of the Priamus, a lovely little passenger cargo ship for which I have no data whatsoever. She's seen here in a lock in the Panama Canal and as you watch you will see her leave this lock to continue her journey.
Across the world, another ship, the Pyrrhus, enters a lock on her way home. She was built by Camel Laird for Blue Funnel and launched in 1949. She was 10,000 tons and she served until 1972. Once the Empress of Britain, Queen Anna Maria has since been called Carnival Fiesta Marina, the Olympic, and she's now the Topaz, the peace boat. We join the Queen Elizabeth in Southampton. She was built by Brown of Clydebank for Cunard in 1938 and initially laid up in New York and then used as a troop ship until 1946. She began passenger service in October 1946 and we watch her here as she crosses the Atlantic. Aided by tugs she moves away from the ocean terminal. We pass the Statue of Liberty on our way to our birth in New York. There's a big crowd to welcome her. She's soon on her way back again to Southampton. She 
was sold in 1969 and renamed Elizabeth, and then at CY's University. Our last shots show her with her paying off pennant. She later sunk in 1974 in Hong Kong Harbour. Brown of Clyde Bank also built the QE2. She was launched in 1967 and we have some rather grainy shots of that launch. Again, some rather poor shots, but these are of her fitting out. We can join her now as she prepares for her maiden voyage in Southampton. At last she's ready to leave. Two tugs pull her away from Ocean Terminal. Her captain is Commodore Warwick. His son, Ron, would later be master of this magnificent ship. Commodore Warwick is the one with the beard. Arrival in New York was quite an exciting affair.
we move on to the year 2008. Here we see QE2 coming to anchor in Tonga. She was on her last world cruise. This was towards the end of February and she was scheduled to carry on until October, having been sold to Dubai interest to act as a floating hotel. Three days later, she was in Auckland. A small crowd came down to the dock to wave her goodbye when she sailed later that night. She sailed on to Sydney where she was in the harbour with the Queen Victoria. She then sailed around the Australian coast to Fremantle where she was to leave Australia for the very last time. As you will see, all sorts of different types of craft came out to bid her farewell.
we say goodbye to her as she sails away into the sunset. Queen Frederica was originally the Matson line of Malola, renamed Matsonia in 1937. Served in the US Navy during the war and sold the home lines and renamed Atlantic. In 1954, she was renamed Queen Frederica. Originally laid down in 1930, the Queen Mary's building was delayed by the Depression. She was eventually launched in 1934. She served as a troop ship from 1940 to 1946. We can watch her now as she approaches Ocean Terminal in Southampton at the end of another Atlantic crossing. An artist takes the opportunity to paint her before her final voyage to Los Angeles. She had been sold to the city of Long Beach become a hotel and tourist attraction. A squadron of helicopters fly past to bid her farewell. Dressed over all and with her paying off pennant flying out behind her, she moves down Southampton water for the last time. takes a London double-decker bus to add to the attraction.
we get a quick glimpse of Queen of Bermuda, built by Vickers Armstrong in 1932 for Furness and Company. She was scrapped in 1966. And here we end part four.